I want to thank all of you who have been leading small groups over the last week. I know we got a great start here on Thursday, and I trust the same was true in your group. If you're a small group leader, the notes for next week are out on the little table just to the left as you go out the door. And um, feel free to use those, modify them, or do something else that you find works better. That's fine. Uh, the main thing is that we're all taking some time over the next uh, five weeks now to work through the book of Philippians. And um, bit by bit, you're going to be sort of putting in all the pieces. And I, I trust that you'll sense at the end of this time that at least there's one book in the New Testament that you know a whole lot better than you did uh, before the Easter season started. Uh, so, um, again, uh, if you're a small group leader, please be um, looking for those notes. They are also online. Lucy puts them online for you, probably already sent out. So, uh, whatever works best for you. I did notice that the pile went down, so I, I made a whole bunch for this next week. And uh, we will be in the first half of chapter 2 with the book of Philippians. Uh, just in case you're sort of keeping up with your Bible reading, you're not quite sure where we are. Uh, basically, I bring the message from that portion of Scripture this morning. We're going to sort of take a look at some other aspects of it during the week. And then um, next week, uh, Pastor Mike will be speaking, and he is bringing us the second half of, um, of chapter 2. Now let's bow our heads together to prepare our hearts for going into God's Word. Father, we thank you for... Uh, beautiful sunshine today. We thank you, Lord, for your promise of new life coming. Uh, even we trust in the next several weeks. Lord, we thank you for bringing us again together safely here in this place all throughout this long winter. We pray, Father, that you be with those who are, are facing difficulties today. I pray for Chris, uh, Chris Johnson, who has had surgery this past uh, past week, I pray your continued healing for him. That he'd be able to be home and be, be doing well. Be with thee, Lord. Strengthen them and help them with this uh, as they now uh, go through the healing process. And we pray for Lee as he faces more surgery. Uh, Lord, we pray for others in our body who are facing um, major health issues uh, in the next uh, weeks and months. We pray your blessing to rest upon them. And we continue to pray for Dawn, and we pray, Lord, for, for Deb that you bless them and, and give them the strength and give them full healing uh, from the uh, disease that they are fighting at this time. Father, we pray for the land of Ukraine. We know that it's a land with many, many wonderful Christian people in it. We've been blessed here in our church to have people from Ukraine who have worshiped with us. And we pray, Father, for you to bring your peace and protection to that land. Uh, in this time of great turmoil, we pray that there not be any uh, any hostilities, Lord, that there not be any, uh, any flashpoints. Father, we pray for the families who lost loved ones with the loss of the airplane this past week, and we pray, Father, for you to bring resolution to that question as well. Lord, our world is a very troubled place, and uh, every time we turn on the news or every time we look at a newspaper or go online, we see evidence of the brokenness of this world. We thank you that we come together around the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ who came to put things back together, to put things back the way you meant for them to be. We ask, Lord, that you would just start that process in our own lives, whatever area needs to be worked on right now. And finally, we pray for those that are serving our country. We give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. On May the 21st of 1972, a mentally deranged geologist named Laszlo Toth walked into St. Peter's Basilica, jumped the barrier protecting Michelangelo's masterpiece, the Pietà, and rained down 12 blows with his geologist's hammer, all the while shouting, I am Jesus Christ. When he was finished, more than 100 fragments of the statue lay scattered on the floor of the basilica. Bystanders, at first dumbfounded, by the desecration of this priceless work of art, then proceeded to scoop up souvenirs. Some would later be returned, many would not. The Pietà, Michelangelo's depiction of Mary cradling the body of the crucified Jesus, had been carved from a single block of marble over a two-year period beginning in 1498. Michelangelo was not yet 25 years old when he finished the statue. Now Mary's nose had been broken off, her eye had been defaced, 
You can see on the left. A hand had been smashed, her left arm had been broken off, and 30 seconds of insanity, or less, had done what 473 years of tumultuous European history had never done. Michelangelo's work was disastrously marred. So what do you do with a marred and defaced and ruined statue? Well, there was quite a debate about what to do with this statue in this condition. Some people argued, leave it just the way it is as a testimony to the violence of the times. Others said, restore it, but mark it with lines at every place where the restoration took place so that it'll be clear as to what was actually Michelangelo's work and what was the work of the restorers. The third option was to undertake what was called an integral restoration, which would mean not leaving so much as a trace of the restorer's work visible to the naked eye. And this raises a big question. For every area of brokenness in our lives, and every area of brokenness in our world, that God calls us to join him in bringing about some kind of restoration. Are we going to take a place in our personal lives where we have been wronged and where we have been marred and turn it into a monument for the wickedness of mankind? Wear the scars and wear the bruises and wear the brokenness, never touching it so that no one around us will ever forget what terrible thing was done to us. Will we go through some sort of healing process but nonetheless Leave the marks of the injury again so that people can see that we've overcome, but they can always also see just how badly we were treated. Will we dare to believe that God could do an integral restoration and that when he was finished, we would be stronger than we were before and the people that would meet us would not even see that damage had been done in the past? In the end, the decision for the Pieta was made to pursue integral restoration. The fragments that the restorers had in hand were painstakingly studied and analyzed and then put back in place. One such fragment came back from the United States. A tourist had picked it up, got a guilty conscience, put it in a little box or whatever, and sent it back. It proved to be one of the very important parts of the reconstruction. Mary's nose was reconstructed from marble that was cut out of the back of the statue, a part that you would never see. And then that was very painstakingly shaped to fit exactly the place where the, the, the tip of her nose had been broken off by the hammer. And so, ten months later, the Pieta was completely restored, and it now resides behind bulletproof glass. The broken face of Michelangelo's Mary is mute testament to the marred image of God that each one of us bears. Paul sums it up this way in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He wasn't talking about in any way that you and I would have glory that would rival that of God. He was saying that we fall short of the glory that God meant for us to portray in his world. Michelangelo's Pieta is an irrefutable testimony to the genius and the skill of its creator. In fact, it's the only piece of sculpture that Michelangelo ever signed. It is said that someone, seeing this beautiful statue, announced that some other sculptor had actually carved it. And Michelangelo went back to the statue and on the sash that runs across Mary's chest, he wrote in Latin, Michelangelo made this. <laughs> you are God's masterpiece, created lovingly by him. God signed you too. He put his name on each and every one of us, if we're willing to wear it. But like the Pieta, you and I have been marred by the evil of this world. 
We are God's handiwork, but we and our world are in desperate need of integral restoration. So who qualifies as a restorer? What does it take to fix a statue that has been smashed with a hammer 12 times, 100 pieces on the floor, limbs broken off, face marred and defaced? Well, think of the qualifications that must have been necessary for joining the team that would restore Michelangelo's masterpiece. Here are a few things that come to my mind. Number one, a restorer would need to know exactly what the statue looked like before it was defaced. You couldn't just sort of start from the broken place and say, well, I think the nose was this long, or I think the hand went this way. You, if you want to get it right, you would have to go back to the original, which of course is exactly what they did. Number two, you would need to be fully committed to bringing the statue back to what it was before, to the original artist's vision. It wouldn't do for you to say, well, I always thought that Michelangelo would have done a better job if he had changed this piece and that piece, and this is my big chance. It's not about you. It's about losing yourself in the vision of a man who lived almost 500 years ago and saying, we're going to bring his vision back to life. You'd need to know how to handle the materials, even to the point of recycling marble from the back of the statue to the front of the statue. And most of all, I think you need to be willing to enter into the brokenness of the statue's marred condition, working from the brokenness to restoration. Paul describes Jesus as the only one qualified to serve as the restorer, not of a statue, however beautiful, but of you and of me. God's statues, God's image, God's creation. He quotes a hymn in the book of Philippians, chapter 2, beginning with verse 6, that tells the story of what I would like to call the Creator's journey of restoration. It begins with these words, Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, speaking of Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. The very first lines there tell us something astounding, that Jesus was in very nature God. The original language says he was in the morphe, the form of God. Paul says the same thing in another letter to another church, the church in Colossae. Listen to these words, Colossians 1, 15 and 16. The Son, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for in him all things were created things in heaven, things on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. So who can be the restorer of a broken world? Well, Jesus not only knows what we're supposed to look like, he is himself the image of the invisible God. He's the template for us all. That's what Paul's saying. Paul's saying the world's a mess. God has come, taken up the task of fixing the world, especially fixing people, fixing you, fixing me. The outward marrings of evil and sin and death, the inward things that nobody else sees, even down to the thought processes that can go off the rails so quickly. So who takes on that job? Give it to you or give it to me, and we're just going to make it more of a mess. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He's the template. He's the model. More, what's more, he was the creator. He's the original sculptor. It's one thing that the restorers of the Pieta could not do is bring Michelangelo back and say, gee, Mr. Michelangelo, we had a problem with your statue. Would you fix it for us? Michelangelo was long gone. So they had to try to imagine being Michelangelo. But when God comes to restore you and me, he doesn't have to imagine or cause anyone else to imagine what it would like, be like to be the creator. The creator himself comes to do the job. Jesus alone qualifies as the restorer of God's image. It takes more than skill and love of, of an ancient statue to make a good restorer. Most of all, the restorer must be willing 
to enter the brokenness. He or she must be willing to work not with the perfection of the original, but with the fragments, embracing, as it were, the hammer blows of the destroyer. It's not enough to hate the destruction or even to hate the person who did it. Each act of destruction must be understood before it can be undone. That means being willing to recreate the violence, to accept it, to say, he must have held the hammer this way. He must have swung it from here and hit the statue in this spot. Only then can you truly understand how to fix the damage. And that is what Jesus did for you and for me. He entered into our brokenness. Listen to what Paul says as he continues this beautiful song. Philippians 2, 7 and 8. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. By becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. In verse 6, Paul said that Jesus was in very nature God, literally in the morphe, the form of God. Now he says, Jesus took on the morphe, the form of a slave. Jesus didn't stop being God. Instead, God himself in Jesus entered into the lowest possible category of humanity for that time. You could not go any lower than to be a slave. To be a slave meant to have absolutely no rights, no autonomy, no status, no identity, no control. You were owned by someone else who could do with you as he or she pleased. And then Jesus went from that lowest status on to die the death reserved for slaves and criminals, crucifixion. He humbled himself. God humbled himself. The creator took a journey. The restorer entered into the brokenness of the world. God humbled himself to a violent, image-marring death. One designed to utterly dehumanize the victim before he left this world. Jesus embraced that fate. He's the one who said, nobody takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Jesus embraced our brokenness. In some ways, as tragic as it is, what happened to the Pieta when a madman came in with a hammer and smashed that beautiful statue is such a powerful picture of our world, of exactly what has happened. Look at the picture of the Pieta. There is Mary holding God in the flesh, who has just finished embracing all the evil of the world, becoming sin for us. Paul writes to this Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God chose to embrace our brokenness. He did not choose to affirm it. He did not say that it was no big deal. He did not say that it was okay or that it was right or that it was his plan. He did not even say that it was our punishment but he entered into it so that he could turn it around. On Easter morning, Jesus stepped out of the garden tomb. God's restoration work was complete. The creator who had entered our brokenness had undone the destruction of evil and death. And now the father restored his son to his rightful place. And that's how the hymn closes, verses 9 through 11. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue can acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If you want to know what the image of God looks like in its fully restored form, you look at Jesus. You see him alive. You see him there with Mary Magdalene. You see him there with his disciples. You see him with Thomas saying, touch the marks. And the only remains of the restoration process left to be proof to us that God had indeed raised the same person 
that all of sin's, sin and death's hammer blows had rained down upon. Jesus took the Creator's journey into God's marred and broken and defaced creation. He became sin for us. Jesus took your journey. Jesus took my journey. Jesus took the journey of Ukrainian people today. Jesus took the journey of grieving Malaysians and Chinese people today. Jesus took the journey that you might take into a doctor's office and come out with a diagnosis that you, you dreaded, but now is, is a medical fact. Jesus took the journey that we take when we go to the funeral home and or we walk away from the graveside of a loved one. Jesus took the journey of brokenness because God was determined not to allow those hammer blows of sin and of death to remain on his image. So Jesus said, I will go in and do the restoration project myself. He unwound every tentacle of evil. He healed every hammer blow of destruction. He reversed every process of death itself. He alone is worthy of worship. He alone is Lord of all. And he alone has the authority to sign his handiwork with his name. And isn't that what it's all about? When we decide to become a follower of Jesus, by our permission, he comes, and as it were, he takes out his little chisel, and he puts across your chest the words, Jesus Christ made this. But he only does it if we give him a chance and give him permission. Now, Paul tells the story of Jesus at this point in his letter for a very important reason, one that reaches all the way to you and to me, to your family, to your friends, to my family, to my friends, to our society, the place where you work. You see, Jesus gave us the work of continuing the restoration of God's image in our places and in our time. Jesus promised to empower us with his spirit so that we could be his restoration agents in this world. And being a follower of Jesus means not only being part of God's new creation. It's not just about receiving God's healing and God's work in our lives. It's not just about me getting myself back the way I was supposed to be by trusting God. It means dedicating ourselves to being restorers of God's creation. Look around the world in which you live. You'll see the hammer blows of sin all over the place. You'll see them in the mirror. You'll see them in your own thoughts. You'll see them in the words and the responses of the people that you interact with. You'll see them in the brokenness of our society and its systems. You'll see what sin has done and is doing. Why does God have us here? He has us here so that we can be part of his work of restoration. That every time we see something broken, someone that is broken, instead of recoiling, instead of pointing our fingers, instead of saying, they shouldn't do that or they shouldn't be like that, God is saying, would you join me in fixing that? Whoa. Not asking us to impose our vision on the restoration. How many times have we done that? Well, I just like to tell them what I think because I know how it ought to be. But we don't know how it ought to be. We just know how the world looks from our own quasi-broken perspective. Instead, he's saying, would you join me? And this is why Paul begins the passage, I'm giving it to you in reverse order, with some very strong and beautiful words to the restorers, to you and to me. Philippians 2, 1 through 5, and you'll look at this some more in your small group, but listen to these words, because this is what it takes to be a restorer of God's creation. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset 
as Christ Jesus. What's it take to be a restorer? Not just to be on the receiving end of restoration, but to be part of God's new creation movement in this world. Well, it starts with becoming one with Jesus, the restorer. Notice the prerequisites. He says, you'll need to be encouraged, not discouraged, not depressed, not down, not feeling hopeless, but encouraged by being united with King Jesus. You need to experience the comfort of his love. Instead of responding with hammer blows for hammer blows, you unwind those hammer blows by bringing God's love and God's creative care into broken places. You share in his spirit. You experience tenderness and compassion. I think about those people who are putting that statue together. <laughs> One of the great finds of all the litter that was on the ground and they scooped up all the little pieces, it may not sound like a big deal, but boy, if you're trying to put this statue back together, was Mary's left eye lid. If you look at the broken pictures of the statue, the hammer had hit her left eyelid and had broken off that incredibly delicate bit of carving. I mean, paper thin. And the excitement was that they found, you can see on the left-hand side, they found that piece. They found it. And they found where it broke off. Now, you don't just put that back with a jackhammer. I mean, you want somebody that's got a steady hand and is willing to, be, to basically do rock surgery at this point to put that tiny little piece back where it belongs. And I'm sure that with the kind of glues and so on they were using, you probably got about one shot at putting it in there. You want it to stick and be right. Tenderness and compassion. He says, you're not going to be self-focused or conceited, but you're going to be people who exude humility, valuing others above ourselves, looking out for the interests of others. I think about those people who so patiently restored this statue over 10 long months. They had to be united with the artist. I mean, they had to go to work every day and not just say, what would Michelangelo do, but what is Michelangelo going to do through us today? They had to learn to share his love for his creation. Man, they had to eat, sleep, and drink that statue. They probably lay in bed all night, puzzling out how they would attack, tackle the next little piece. Might be a little chip of rock this big, but go over it and over it and over it, discuss it and plan and come up with a solution. They had to lovingly, and get that, lovingly put back what hate and violence had taken away. You couldn't just go in there and go, I'm so mad at that guy. Here, put it back on there. Oh, no. You can't enter into that violence. You've got to go the other way. There's only one thing that will unwind that violence, and that is loving, tender, humble behavior. Humble enough to not make the project about themselves. It wouldn't do. Take your family in one day and go, See that finger? I did that. <laughs> no. You have to be able to put the statue up and nobody knows that you touched it. Isn't that what God wants from us in our dealings with each other? He's not going to look for Roland's fingerprints on Church of the Rock, thank God. So my job is not to leave any. Your job is not to leave fingerprints on those people, even the ones you care the most about. We want to leave God's fingerprints. That's our job in a messy and unfair world. We'll be tempted to immortalize the violence. That's called being unforgiving. Building a little statue around what happened to me. We all struggle with that, perhaps to some degree or another. After all, if we get better, They'll never pay. Would we dare to let God really make us better? Leave it in his hands? Leave the mad geologist with the hammer in the hands of the professionals? 
while we fix the statue? God has called us to be his restorers of his image in this world. Can you think of a higher calling? That whatever you do with your life, whatever career you have, whether you're at home raising a family, whether you are working in the workplace, whatever your case might be, that the real job that you had was to join God in these restoration projects with the expressed goal that nobody would ever know that you even touched your subject because God did his work so well that only his name was on it, only his fingerprints were on it. The only way we can do this is by taking our eyes off ourselves and saying, Jesus, you're the creator. You're the image. Somehow you've chosen to work through me to do some of your work. I give you permission. He alone can give us the power and the wisdom to join him in putting the broken pieces back together. And God has chosen to do that work through you. He invites you to join him on a creator's journey. We bow our heads together. Ask if our prayer team would come down. For some of us, this can be very hard stuff because the damage is far more profound than 30 seconds of hammer blows on a piece of marble. You might be talking about 30 years of abuse on something as precious and delicate as a human soul, a broken spirit. You might be talking about things that happened to a child, maybe even an infant. Satan is merciless when it comes to marring God's image. Might be things that we've done to ourselves. And we look at God and say, well, you could never, never use me to restore me because I'm guilty. I'm the guy with the hammer. It may be the others that we have hurt. We've just come to the place where we see the damage we've done. But what are the chances they would let the geologist who thought he was Jesus Christ join the restoration team? I doubt that would ever happen. But God is bigger than all of those circumstances. So I want to challenge you right now with your head bowed and your eyes closed to just let God point out to you one hammer blow, one chip on the statue, one place of brokenness. In yourself, in your world. Maybe something that bugs you right now. Maybe something you argued about in the car coming down here today. Maybe something you just try never to think about, but the Holy Spirit is bringing you there right now. Now the question is, would you join him on the Creator's journey? He's not asking you to fix it. He's not asking you to come up with the magic words or the magic actions. He's saying, would you let me, let my love, my tenderness, my compassion, my humility shine through you so that I could restore something broken through you unwind some piece of destruction in this world what that looks like well you and God are going to figure that out it may come to conversations it may come to forgiveness it may come to a lot of prayer I think that'll be the main thing you'll do for a long time it's going to come to seeing the world and seeing people a different way it starts with saying, yes, Lord, I'll take the Creator's journey. Stand with me if you would. And I'm going to do something we don't normally do. As we're standing here, if you can think of a place where God wants to do restoration in your life or in your world, would you come down and join me down front here? Just come. I want to pray over you here. 
And I, as, we, as the team sings, just come. 